Hi there! Today I have a poem for you full of vengeance, death, and fire. And that poem is Atlakvida, which can be found in the Codex Regis manuscript, which is also known as the Poetic Edda. So join me as we dive into the Old Norse world of family feud. Welcome aboard the International Express to Book Central. Grab a seat, settle in, and let's get medieval. I'm your host, Jules, and today we're doing Atlakvida, and I'm very excited because it is probably my favorite Old Norse poem. I've been obsessed with this poem since the first time I read it. I keep writing about it in my own work, and so I'm just, yeah, very excited to share it with you today. Before I get into the first lines, the plot, etc., it's worth just very briefly talking about the title of this poem. As you may have seen, there's a weird letter in there that we don't really see all that often, especially no longer in English. And that is that weird thing that looks like a reverse D. That is the letter F. And as the name implies, the sound that it makes is a th. So that's where we get the name Atla Kvida from. Now, what does Atla Kvida mean? Well, Kvida is the Old Norse word for, well, something like song or narrative poem. And it comes from the Old Norse verb kveda, which means to say or to utter, to recite, etc. Atla, the first part of the word, is the genitive form of the name atli. So what we have here is atla kveda, or the song, the poem of atli. Now who is atli? Well, we're going to find all of that out very soon. But Atlakvida is one of the heroic poems that we find in the Poetic Edda, or, as I said, in the Codex Regis manuscript. This manuscript dates to the 13th century, so we think that it was potentially written around the 1270s, but it is the only source that we have for this poem, Atlakvida, so that makes it very exciting. Now, as you may know from previous Let's Get Medieval episodes, it's never quite straightforward when it comes to the date of a medieval text. So although Atlakvida is found in a manuscript from the 1270s, there is a lot of speculation that Atlakvida is actually a lot older. Now, again, as won't surprise you, scholars aren't necessarily in agreement about how old it is, but some have suggested that it might be as old as the 9th century, so somewhere around the 800s. So we're dealing with something very old and legendary here. And that's why I love it. So before I get lost in any more academic conjecture here, let's just dive into the poem. I'm going to give you the first verse in Old Norse first and then in my own translation. Atli sendi ar til gunars kunansek adrida knefrödr Far sau heitin, ad gurdum com han giuca, og ad gunars hötle, vecium arin grebum, og ad björis fausum. And here is my translation. Atli sent a messenger to Gunnar, a knowledgeable man to ride. Knefröder was he called. To Gyuki's homesteads came he, and to Gunnar's hall, to the hearth surrounding benches, and to the sweet beer. And with that, we're off. So, we've already met the man after who this poem is named, Atli. Atli has sent a messenger called Knefröder to Gunnar. Gunnar and Atli are both... I wouldn't necessarily use the word king, because I don't know if it feels appropriate in the context of this poem specifically, but you could call them that as well. They are both very important men with their own homesteads, halls, and troops, and treasures. So... Atli sends this man off to Gunnar, and we wonder why. But at least we are told that at Gunnar's hall there is sweet beer, so that could be a good enough reason to send someone over. However, when Knefröder gets to this hall of Gunnar, we are told that the followers of Gunnar who are in this hall are kind of hesitant, they're wary about this man, 
because, well, they know of old that the Huns are capable of warfare and of wrath. So, Knefroeder enters this hall and we are told that he speaks crafty words to Gunnar, who is sitting on the high bench. And he says, Atli has sent me to you on this errand. I and my horse have ridden through Mirkwood, and we are now here, Gunnar, to invite you to visit Atli at his own hall. There you will get to choose weapons out of his treasury, gold-adorned helmets, for example, and shirts of bright red, lances, spears, horses, etc. We will have all of these things for you if you just ride with me. So, he's come for a invitation. That's not necessarily bad. So Gunnar listens to this and then he turns to his brother, Hugni, who's sitting or standing next to him and he says, well, what do you think? Should we do this? I have plenty of gold, so I don't need to go visit Atli for his gold. <laughs> like all the things he has, I have better ones. So we get this little list from Gunnar about how his horse is the quickest, his sword is the sharpest, and he therefore has no need to go visit Atli for treasure. And Hugni is, I would say, the clever one. And he says, have you noticed that along with this message, our sister has sent us a ring, and this ring is woven with a wolf's hair? Now, what could this possibly mean, except that we are probably riding into a trap? So Hugni isn't very eager for this journey, but Gunnar is maybe a little insulted in his honor, or he is a bit bitter about something, and so he says, you know what? We are going. It is happening. The wolves shall rule the wealth of the Nibelungen, is what he says. And that is an epic line. And so Gunnar decides that he and his brother shall follow Knefröder to Atli's hall, even though they have been warned by their sister that they are riding into a trap. And so they get ready to leave and we are told that, you know, his followers are weeping as the two leave and Hugni's young son calls after him and says, be safe. And so the heroes set off and we are told that the kind of earth shakes as they gallop their horses through it, which is stunning imagery. They go through Mirkwood and through the fields and eventually they see Atli's hall. Now, remember their sister, who was able to send a message along with the messenger, this coded message that warned of a trap, this ring bound by wolf's hair. Well, her name is Guthrun, and she is married to Atli. So when her brothers, Gunnar and Hugni, rock up at Atli's hall, she's one of the first to notice, and while everyone has been drinking ale, she hasn't. And so she comes out and she says, You are betrayed, Gunnar. I warned you that this was going to happen. Why have you come? This is going to be horrible. I wish you had never come here, or that if you had come, that you would have brought some warriors with you. And Gunnar says, it's too late. For your warning, heroes simply must come and face danger. And then at least warriors kind of storm out of the hall, and they seize Gunnar, the king, and they bind him. They try to do the same with Hugni, but... Hugni is a warrior through and through, and he slays seven of the warriors, and apparently he kicks an eighth into the fire. And that is, we are told, how a hero should fight to protect his lord. So Atli comes out, and he says, Would you like to save your life? I will not kill you if you will give me your treasure. And Gunnar says, Absolutely not. You are not getting my treasure unless I hold Hugni's heart in my hand. And that is, that is quite a demand to have your brother's heart in your hand. And Atli's like, let's see if we can trick this man. So what they do is they cut the heart out of a man called Hjatli and they carry this on a platter to Gunnar. Gunnar looks at it and says, you cannot fool me. Look at this heart lying here on this platter, trembling the way it did when it was still in the chest of Hjatli. So he can see that it's not the heart of his valiant brother, Hugni. So they have to go back to Hugni. And as they cut out his heart, he laughs. 
he refuses to cry. And so Hugni dies. Now they carry Hugni's heart to Gunnar. And Gunnar says, well, thank you very much. This is a heart that does not tremble, even as it lies here. It trembled even less when it was in the chest of my brother. And yet, Atli, you shall never see this gold that you want from me. It was only ever the two of us, Gunnar and Hugni, who knew where this treasure lay. And now that Hugni is dead, I am the last one to know its secret location. And you will never see it. Our gold will never shine on the hands of your men. Atli is upset by this. And so he says, bring the wagon, bind this man. He is going to die as well. Poor Guthrun, meanwhile, is standing in the middle of all of this madness. And she refuses to cry, we are told. And instead she says, Atli, the way that you have just betrayed my brother, you shall be betrayed too. All the oaths that you swore to him will come and hit you double. So Gunnar is cast into a pit of serpents, which are intended to kill him, of course. But what he finds there as well is a harp, and he plays this harp. And while he plays it, none of the snakes bite him. But eventually, he is overcome, and so too does Gunnar die. Now, Atli rides home, absolutely satisfied, apparently, with what he has just done. And when he comes back to his hall, Guthrun meets him outside with a golden beaker, and she says, Welcome home, Lord. I have prepared meats for you, and there is ale for you to drink. And so a feast starts, and Atli and his Huns are drinking, and they're having a great time, and Guthrun is kind of walking through the hall, and we are told in the Old Norse that she seems to kind of be slithering, maybe. There's clearly a plan here. And she's bringing food and drink to all of these men until she says that she will speak their doom. And she tells him and the surrounded men that they have just eaten the hearts of Atli's and her sons. That they, heavy with blood, dripped in honey, were on their plates. And she says, never again will you call our sons, who are called Erp and Etil, to your lap. Never again will you see them having fun here in the hall or riding their horses. And of course, this news creates chaos in the hall. We are told that the men are crying out, that they're weeping. And again, the only one who is not crying is Guthrun herself. She cries neither for her brothers, nor for the boys that she loved, for her own sons. And apparently this catastrophe has hit Atli so hard that he's not really paying attention. We are also told again that he is rather drunk. So rather than having Guthrun, I don't know, put in jail or stopped, he does take her back to his bedroom. And we are told that he takes her back to where they used to play and used to have fun. And what she does instead is that she stabs him. And with her death-dealing hand, she kills Atli, she releases the hounds who apparently make so much noise that all the servants wake up, and with a lit torch or a lit branch, she then puts fire to the hall, and that is how she has her revenge. The fire takes up everything, the hall, the temple, and the last image we get is of Guthrun standing in front of this burning hall where she has lost her brothers, her sons, and now her husband too. And the poem's final verse goes thus. Fotlrat erum theta, fer engis vau sidan, bruder i brinju, brödra ad hefna, hon he vir trigia thios kununga baun orth borit, björt auder suti. And that is what this means. About this enough has been said. Since then, no young woman in a burnie, so in armour, avenged her brothers thus. She has given the death message to three kings of the people, that bright one, before she died. And that is Atlakvida. So, 
that is quite a bloody poem. We have plenty of death, we have some torture, there is some unfortunate infanticide, and there is the utter collapse of a society. And yes, that is the reason that I love this poem. <laughs> Don't know what that says about me, but it's just an incredibly evocative text in my mind. Just the way that it describes this conflict which Guthrun has. And I don't know if that came through as strongly in my summary as I would have liked, but we're going to dive into Guthrun's character right now, because of course she's my favorite. Guthrun finds herself in an impossible situation. And in order to understand how impossible her situation really is, it is worth just briefly mentioning that, well, weddings and relationships and marriages in the Middle Ages weren't necessarily formed for love especially in the early Middle Ages. Quite often, marriages would be arranged between different families, and they would say, our daughter can marry your son, and that way, hopefully, we won't get into a fight every couple of months. But instead, we'll be united through this marriage, they'll have children, and those children will be part of both of us, and that will ensure some kind of peace. That was the hope behind those kind of marriages. So that is also what we have here with Guthrun. She is a part of the Gyukings, or the Burgundians. It kind of depends on what the poem chooses to call them, but her father was called Gyuki, and therefore her and her brothers are the Gyukings. So Guthrun was married off to Atli, who is the leader of the Huns, in order to prevent any more bloodshed between these two peoples. But the Burgundians famously have a treasure, which is known as the Nibelungen treasure, usually. And Atli... Well, he's a bit greedy and he wants this. And so he decides to invite his brothers-in-law and kill them for this treasure. Now, this is exactly what is not supposed to happen when a marriage has united two different families or groups of people together, right? So now Guthrun kind of stands in the middle of this conflict. On the one side is her husband, whom she has married, and they have sons together, she kind of lives among his people, you know, there are ties of loyalty and maybe even friendship and affection there. But on the other hand, there are her brothers, who she grew up with, her blood family, and who she also owes a certain kind of loyalty to. So what does she do? Well, that is the question that this poem asks, and the poem itself isn't quite sure whether Guthrun does the right thing or not. Because once her brothers have been killed by her husband through treachery and by him betraying every oath he ever swore to her and to them, well, she chooses to take vengeance. And in doing so, she kills her own two sons and serves them up to him, which combines two of the biggest taboos <laughs> that I think any culture ever has known, which is infanticide and cannibalism. So that is quite a vengeance to take. And I think this is where that final stanza that I read to you is so important as well, because it speaks of how this woman, this woman in a bernie, this woman in armor, although she doesn't wear armor in the poem, it's a kind of ennobling epithet that she gets there. It's a nice way of describing her, very poetic. It speaks of how she has avenged her brothers, unlike any woman before or after her, which seems to suggest a certain kind of respect, right? But then it also says she killed three kings of the people, by which I think they mean Atli and her two sons. And then that kind of, that saying of, well, no one has ever done this again afterwards, is almost like a warning. And scholars have spoken about how there's a kind of begrudging, but also a little scared respect for Guthrun here, about how she could go so far, and how maybe she was right to avenge her brothers. But no one should ever do that again, probably. <laughs> it's kind of like, well, this woman was a badass, but please, women, do not do this, okay? This is a step too far, really. And that's where it's, again, important to remember that this is a heroic legend, right? Things happen in myths and legends that I think are overdrawn or that feel extreme, but they are meant to signify something else. They're not meant to be a manual for this is how you should behave. So what we get here in this poem through this tragedy, through the fact that, you know, the Gyukings both die, Gunnar and Hogni are gone, which means that their people no longer have leaders, 
and Atli and all of his men are gone, his entire hall has been burned down, his sons are dead, so there's no future there either. What that kind of speaks to is this deep fear that a culture, a civilization, a society can come to an end, right? That internal feuding, that fighting between family members, between friends, between people who've sworn each other oaths, that that can lead to a complete collapse of civilization. And I think anyone who thinks about that for long enough can probably follow how terrifying that is. <laughs> I think if we look around at our own world, we come to realize how much of what makes up our everyday life is based on agreements we've made with each other, whether those are contracts we have signed or just, well, things that we discussed between us and said, okay, I'm not going to take your stuff, you're not going to take my stuff for good, right? And if you cannot trust those bonds, well, everything becomes very shaky, doesn't it? One of the reasons I enjoy medieval literature like this is that those kind of concerns which we can still feel today also occur there. And you realize that all the stress that we are feeling now, the anxiety of our busy modern world, a lot of that isn't necessarily a modern thing. It's not just an issue now. It's something that people have been wondering about for hundreds of years. How secure is our society? Can we trust the words of others? Who should come first? Which loyalty is the most important? Should I stick close to my family or should I stick close to my partner? Which bonds are the most important? Those are the questions that Atlakvida asks and it does so through the figure of our heroine Guthrun, who, well, maybe she goes too far but did she have a choice, really? <laughs> that is the question that the poem asks as well. Did Guthrun really have a choice except going to such extremes in her vengeance? Could she just have stood by as her husband killed her brothers and gone, that's fine, I have a new family now? Or was there more? Well, I've rambled on about the plot for a bit now, but I want to give you a little bit more of a background to this poem as well. And you might have already, as I've been talking about the characters and about the plot, picked up on a couple of things that made you go, huh, I've heard that before, probably most significantly with the word Nibelungen. The Nibelungen material is potentially one of the most fruitful, fertile ones that have come out of the Middle Ages, at least in my personal opinion. This is a personal opinion. There's plenty of people who don't necessarily like the Nibelungen material but I'm low-key obsessed with it. So for that, I want to take you back in time even further. And I'm going to give you a metaphor here, which I also give to my students when I talk about this material, and that is the idea of an onion. So as we all know, ever since Shrek came out and said that ogres are like onions, we're all aware that onions have layers, right? And if you look at a poem like Atlakvida, I think it's very useful to conceptualize it as something of an onion as well, with different layers, different ways in which the story has been told. So we're going to go through this onion layer by layer, but I'm going to start at the core, at the center of it, and that is the potential historical origins of the Nibelungen material and therefore also of Atlakvida, and that is with the downfall of the Burgundians who used to have a kingdom along the Rhine. Now, this is somewhere in the early 400s. So I think the date that is often given for the destruction of this kingdom is 436 or 437 AD. So at this point, like I said, the Burgundians had a kingdom on the Rhine and they were led by a king called Gundaharius. He had something of a disagreement with the Romans he no longer wanted to be part of the Roman Empire, or they had some kind of agreement where the Burgundians would kind of assist the Roman Empire at times, and he wanted out of that agreement. But of course, the Romans couldn't just let that fly by, right? So a Roman general called Flavius Aetius destroyed the Burgundian kingdom with some assistance from kind of Hunnish mercenaries, Hunnish warriors, 
and Gundaharius died in this conflict, the king and the Burgundians were cast out of their territory and they eventually resettled kind of near what we now know as Geneva and Lyon, so somewhere in France. Now, this took place during a period which historians often call the migration period, which took place in Europe somewhere between 3 and 800 AD, which is, that's a very large estimate, but we're dealing with complex events here because during this time, the Western Roman Empire fell and different tribes kind of invaded this dying empire from the east, especially the Huns, of course, but also other tribes. And that means that during this migration age, loads of people were forced to move, etc. And what that gives you is something of a historic trauma. So there were all these peoples who were witness to their kingdoms, to their societies being destroyed, having to kind of run or flee, migrate, etc. And something like that leaves traces in a culture and in a society. And in this case, that trauma led to the creation of art and literature. So as I mentioned, the Burgundian king who was killed and who saw his kingdom destroyed was named Gundaharius, and he is who becomes Gunnar in the Old Norse material, or Gunther in the Middle High German material. Because it's not just medieval Iceland which told stories about these events, they were very much told within Europe as well. So. At the center of our onion, <laughs> we have this historic event in the early 5th century. Now, our next layer is a combination between, well, some written sources, which we mostly have found through fragments, which pretend a telling history, but are, of course, biased in their own ways. Every history book is written from a certain perspective, right? And when we have medieval sources which say this is how these wars took place they are also written from a certain perspective so we have some mentions of this conflict with the burgundians there in those historic sources we are also told about how attila the hun died suddenly after a wedding in the middle of the fifth century and this wedding was potentially to a germanic woman called hildiko and in this second layer we also have plenty of oral storytelling most likely. So stories that were told from person to person, generation to generation, and we have no sources for these. It's not like they could record them, right? So these are just stories that were consistently told and retold. And now we come to our next layer, which is when we get our first written sources. And at this point, it is worth saying that the story from that historic core had changed quite significantly. So around 1200, we have the Middle High German epic poem called Das Nibelungenlied. And here we have a very complex story, which is no longer just about the downfall of a single kingdom. It has brought in other kinds of material, specifically from the north. So this story starts with another figure that you might know called Siegfried, or in Old Norse Sigurdr, who is a dragon slayer. And he becomes married to a woman called Krimhild, who is the Old Norse Guthrun. They are married, it is stunning, until her brothers are like, wait a minute, this dragon slayer got a treasure from that dragon, and we want that treasure. So they kill Siegfried, and then Krimhild is super upset. She marries a man called Etzel, which is the Middle High German form of Atli, or the version of Attila that they have. And she plans vengeance against her brothers. And she makes sure that her brothers die, but in the process, her son dies and she herself dies. And the Nibelungenlied basically ends on, the world has collapsed. All these heroes are dead. This woman who tried to avenge her husband against her brothers is dead. The only one who's left is, is Etzel or Atli or Attila, and he is heartbroken. So the Nibelungen lead is already quite a complex version of this historical trauma at the center, right? Well, that is our next layer. But then after that, we must, of course, go back to the Codex Regis manuscript that we know. So the 
Poetic Edda, which was written around 1270. That's what I would call our fourth layer. As I mentioned at the beginning, all the way at the beginning, about half an hour ago, is that even though the Codex Regis was written down in the 1270s, some of the poems it contains are probably a lot older than that. So Atlak Fida is most likely an oral poem which was told for centuries, potentially as early on as the 9th century, and it was just told and retold until someone wrote it down in the 13th century. So Atlak Fida finds itself somewhere between the layers, but the only actual representation we have of it is that in the Poetic Edda from 1270. Now another kind of layer that I would add is a text called Volsunga Saga. This is an Old Norse prose saga. Now we think it probably dates to the 13th century as well. The manuscript version that we have, again we only have one manuscript version of this, dates to about 1400. So that's why I would put it a little later. Now these aren't the only texts or stories that have been written about this kind of core historical trauma in which a kingdom falls apart and a woman may or may not have avenged this by killing Attila the Hun. There are also Latin sources which kind of depend on this. There is a Middle Dutch translation seemingly of the Nibelungenlied from this time, but the Old Norse material is very interesting in part because of the attention that it gives to Guthrun, in my opinion, <laughs> to the way it kind of sketches the difficult position that she is in. And this position she finds herself in, of having to choose between her blood family, so her brothers, and her Afenor family, so the family she's married into, is one which echoes throughout a lot of other Old Norse material as well. The reason I find it so interesting is that, as you may have picked up uh, when I was talking about the Nibelungenlied, there she makes a different choice, in part because it introduces her first husband, Sigurd, as well. In the Nibelungenlied, Krimhild, so that's our middle high version of Guthrun, chooses to avenge herself against her brothers rather than for her brothers. In Atlakvida, we just get a little snippet of this entire story, of this entire complex trauma and kinship confusion, right? So Atlak Vida does not mention Guthrun's first husband. It entirely positions Guthrun in a conflict between brothers and husbands without previous conflict. Whereas in Das Nibelungenlied, we get a bigger story. We get a first marriage first betrayal by her brothers, and then an active decision to avenge yourself against your brothers. Now, I think I might have belabored that point a little bit, but <laughs> it is an important difference that in the Middle High German material, which was written in an environment which was much more courtly, it was already a lot more religious, so it was a society that already placed quite a lot of importance on that matrimonial bond, which can already considered two people to be bound together, not just by love, but also by God. So that relationship between those two married people suddenly becomes the most important thing. Whereas in the Old Norse material, and it's worth bearing in mind that Iceland was Christianized a lot later than the rest of Europe. It only became Christian around the year 1000. So although it was definitely a Christian country by the time Atlakvida was written down, it still had quite a long period in which perhaps marriage was considered a little differently, where the connections between blood family took primacy over any other bond, right? So in the Old Norse material, the most important relationship that Guthrun decides to prioritize is that between her and her brothers. Now, at this point we have that onion, and you can keep adding layers to the onion. Four layers, that makes for a small onion, but like I said, you can add all kinds of other medieval literature to it. You can add Wagner's kind of musical extravaganza to it as well, add the ring cycle, and add all kinds of other material that has been inspired by this conflict. And I enjoy an onion like this. <laughs> I really like literature that proves to be so complex, that speaks to themes that we might still feel today, 
to worries about how stable our societies and cultures are, to kind of concerns about migration, about having to move, but also having other people arrive, right? I think those are worries that many people today still feel. And I think it's actually quite comforting to find out that people have always dealt with issues like this, that we have always found different ways of addressing stresses about where do we live? Where can we stay? Are we safe? What is most important in my life? On that delightful note, I think I will draw a close to this episode, <laughs> but I would love to know your thoughts about the Nibelungen material, about Atlagfida. I will probably do other episodes in the future about Nibelungen-related material, so if you have any questions about it, feel free to shoot me an email or put it in a comment. This is kind of a lot of material and a lot of stuff. So it might be that not all of it came across as clearly as I hoped. But Atlak Vida is an epic poem. It ends the way every modern day horror movie <laughs> with a feminist angle ends, which is a woman covered in blood outside of a burning building. And I think that again shows us some stories are worth telling over and over again. And that's it for today. If you have questions, thoughts on the book, or recommendations or requests for future episodes, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email at bookcentralpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to be informed when new episodes drop. You can find references to the materials used today in the description. Book Central is written and produced by me, and our music is by Scott Buckley. Thank you for joining me today on the International Express to... Look central.